I'm Blair Johnson, and in this talk I'm going to talk about meta-analysis and effect sizes. So what is a meta-analysis without an effect size index? I think you can answer that question for yourself. It's not a meta-analysis. So I'm going to introduce effect sizes, and in this talk I'll focus on meta-analysis of means, which I, I think is an underutilized strategy. So in the big picture we've got these seven steps, of course. Finally, we're to that golden mean portion of the class where we're starting to talk about calculating effect sizes. So we've, we've done all the important work of formulating the problem, finding the studies, we've coded them for important features, and now we're calculating effect sizes. Um, and of course, that's all prerequisite to analyzing the, the systematic review database, so all of that's woven together in this analysis. So what I'll talk about here is, first, I've just given you a big picture on systematic reviews with meta-analysis. I'm introducing effect size. I'll briefly discuss families of two variable effect sizes, which are the conventional form of doing meta-analysis. And then I'm going to give you a radical one that's underused. It's actually been used for a long time. You'll see, maybe without calling it meta-analysis. And then I'll leave you with a few discussion questions. So what is an effect size? I would argue it's essentially a ratio of signal to noise. You know, most inferential statistics basically are doing nothing but that. You've got some sort of variance that you're dividing, literally an analysis of variance. You're making components of variance that are attributable to different variables. So it is a signal to noise ratio. Signal would be whatever you can make out of the data. In this particular graphic, you might be able to see the word signal popping out or not. There's too much noise to see it. In this one, you've got a large effect size. Signal bursts out from the background noise, and you've got a large effect size. So here's a small effect size, maybe not even visible to the naked eye. Maybe, I don't know about color blindness in this one. Maybe someone can tell me. But in this one, boom, you've got a huge effect size, and the signal is much, much bigger compared to the background noise. Uh, Lipsy and Wilson provided a very helpful table of effect sizes. Look at this, like 10 of them in this table, 11 something, I didn't count them. Um, the ones that get the most attention are the mean scores here, mean gain scores, mean difference scores, and then of course, uh, well, the odds ratio is pretty pretty big, and the product moment R, Pearson, Pearson's correlation. Um, <clears throat> those are the ones that tend to show up, and as I'll discuss, the arithmetic mean gets very little attention. There are other forms too. That I think it's worth studying a table like this to see what you could do. And in meta-analysis, if you have an effect size statistic in either a standard error or an inverse variance, and I mean, it's a good question for class to discuss, well, what the heck is the difference between it? Well, you could think about this one on the right as, as the weight. Uh, maybe a more intuitive thing, like with the with the R correlation, it's a nice way to think about it. The weight is n minus 3. The, the larger the study is, the more weight it gets. Whereas if you're thinking of the standard error, it's an inverse of it. Okay. Uh, so they're really doing the very same thing. It's just that the inferential statistics packages will force you to choose either the SE or the inverse variance, or what's often called the weight. So if you think about two variable effect sizes, there's a whole matrix of them. And you can consider them in, uh, in, in a... Uh, it, as a function of whether one variable is continuous, ordinal, or categorical, and the other one along the same dimension. So let's start over here on the right. Uh, if you have a categorical independent variable and a continuous outcome variable, that's a point by serial correlation. It's a standardized effect size, could be D or G, uh, whether it's corrected or not. We'll talk about that. Uh, you could have an unstandardized mean effect size over here. All of those are categorical between groups comparisons with a continuous uh, outcome. Uh, you could have two continuous variables. Then you've got a Pearson correlation or standardized regression slopes or beta weights or unstandardized regression slopes. I mean, it doesn't mean you could do meta-analysis just willy-nilly with any of these, but if you get them on the same scale, like unstandardized regression slopes are going to assume that the underlying variables, the independent variables and the outcome variables are measured exactly the same across studies. Then you could meta-analyze them. Okay. Let's go down here to the bottom right. If you had a categoric, both categorical variables, you could use a phi coefficient, which is the version of the correlation that is analogous to, say, a Pearson correlation. And then the odds ratio is very widely used, as is the risk ratio. Sometimes you see the risk difference. I'm not going to go into any of these in great detail today. 
If you have an ordinal uh, variable with a continuous variable, that's a biserial correlation. And it's kind of interesting. A lot of people willy-nilly assume that these RB and RPB are the same thing as R. They're not. Okay, The underlying scaling actually has implications for what is calculated. And finally, these are not, not highly used, but if you've got two, two ordinal variables, the Spearman is in that category and Tetrachoric is in that category, and rank by serial would be a categorical variable with an ordinal one. And which one is first and which one is second is probably pretty arbitrary. So the, these are what people are doing out there conventionally with meta-analysis. They're taking one of these effect sizes and uses it, using it in their analyses, standardizing across studies, of course. Um, a little closer look at the standardized mean difference. Cohen is attributed with the, the basic one, and I don't think he put one and two in his equation, but let's just assume that he, he did. Um, you're going to have two means. Uh, you're going to compare them. You'll divide them by the standard deviation. It's a simple enough equation. Um, so that's a two-group thing. You've got a, a categorical independent variable and a continuous dependent variable. It's standardized because the standard deviation is the denominator, okay? So it's very similar to a unit normal Z, and it's, in, it's interpreted very similar to that. When you're meta-analyzing Cohen's Ds, you're actually meta-analyzing standard deviation units. So um, that's maybe worth a discussion in and of itself. But usually we use the pooled standard deviation in here. So the SP, <clears throat> Cohen didn't actually specify that, but in conventional use, that's what's happening. So some uh, pooled standard deviation is basically like a sample weighted average across whatever you're pooling. You could pool more than two of them if you've got multiple groups, of course. Um, and um, <coughs> about 30 years ago, a little more than that, um, Hedges offered a sample size correction for this effect size, the standardized mean difference SMD. Um, now, he, he called it D. Use after that has started to call it G or G star. Um, there's a table in Johnson and Egley that discusses many of these varying, very confusing conventions. And I could go on a half an hour and rant about this, um, but it's not worth it. Let's go on. There are numerous equivalent equations to calculate the standardized mean difference. We'll talk about those later, not in this talk, but in a future talk, um, if I get to it. And there's a version of D also that you can use for repeated measures. So um, it's very, very similar to this. It's just a pretest versus post, post test, and you're dividing by the standard deviation of the pretest conventionally. And if you want a name for that, it's Becker, 1980, no, 19, I'm, I don't have the date in front of 1988, I think it is. So, but what about the one variable alternative? This is the one no one thinks about, and I'm going to argue in this talk that you might actually want to take advantage of this thing. Meta-analyses of arithmetic means have been rare to date, so I'm going to give you a quick example. Uh, Gene Twenge has popularized something called cross-temporal meta-analysis. So you examine the mean values of scales for particular samples over time. So here's one that I've mocked up from her original one from um, the year 2000, uh, published in the journal JPSP, showed that in cohorts of young people, either high school students or, or university students, college students, you see a can a very sharp rise in anxiety levels. So here I put it on one of the common scales for it, um, just to give you a sense of the result. So you can actually meta-analyze means, okay? So now, a quick caveat about the whole thing. There's not going to be a lot of the statistical nitty-gritty on this. I'm just trying to give you the idea of what it means to, to uh, analyze means. There'll be some equations ahead. Don't panic, obviously. All right, so... Um, case of global warming as a case of analyzing the mean uh, temperature value. So uh, several years ago, there was an article in Scientific America about whether humans stopped an ice age. This is Michael Mann, who's currently at, I think, Penn State, and he's, he's drawn quite a lot of attention for this work, and some of it negative from people who don't believe it. So um, here's, uh, here's the, the so-called hockey stick, which shows that upward trajectory of, the, of this uh, temperature curve. Look at all this data over, look, a whole millennium worth of data. And look, we're, you know, this has all been, been put on the same scale of, um, I forget, uh, where is it, zero? So zero is around 1900, I think, in the scale. So going back, you can see like um, in the 
around 1500. There's the Little Ice Age from the Medieval Ages. So these are data gathered from uh, tree rings and ice cores and so on. And then where you get direct temperatures here in the last 150 years, that's when we finally had millimeters of mercury in, in, um, in, in thermometers. So uh, now we actually get accurate data. And if you zoom in on, on, okay, let's first do a regression line. If you project it out, we would be headed towards another glacial age. And Michael Mann pointed out, hey, that's not happening anymore. The hockey stick shows that we're going the opposite way. And now you've got this huge effect size, effectively, uh, against which deniers rate, rail and, um, and believers um, are in this fight with them. So um, that's, that's what the controversy was then. And, and I hear, I'll zoom in. So uh, in the early years of, of data, these are all, all compiled from people looking at you know, contemporary time backwards. You've got tree rings, coral, ice cores, historical records. Look, people, this almost has to be a meta-analysis. And it's showing you the noise and measures, which they argue is because data are sparser in the past. Well, I'm guessing that those are indirect measures of temperature, too, and there are lots of foibles that enter into it as well. So sampling error ends up being higher. There's more noise. Um, but a wonderful example of essentially what is meta-analysis of the means, except for probably they didn't label it meta-analysis when they published it. Okay, so it's out there, and, and real scientists use this strategy. Here's another example of compiling data over time. This is a beautiful graphical demonstration of what's happening to temperature over time. It's a beautiful image of what for most people is a really ugly thing. Um, the world getting hotter. Really nice demonstration. Uh, this was several years ago. I found a new one that projects it. I think this was made in 2020. Um, so Ed Hawkins was the original image. He's, these are this very same data in there, but now we're projecting it forward in time the same way that we did with the Michael Mann demonstration. And um, it's just seasonally going around. So of course, temperatures vary somewhat seasonally, but around the whole globe, not so much. And now we project forward in time and we end up with this super hot earth by the time we reach the end of the current century. Wow. You could do meta-analysis of the means and do things like the intelligence of samples. In fact, this has been done. So they've got over a century of data on the so-called Flynn effect, named for James Flynn, who's an Australian psychologist, I think, or maybe sociologist, uh, who's, ex who's shown that generation by generation, IQ scores continue to go up. So uh, you, you get these, in, at least in the westernized developed world, you get each generation is smarter than the last. It just makes a prof this is like nightmares for, for professors because their, their students are ever smarter. Um, and um, here's results from the very same meta-analysis that, that indeed IQ keeps going up. Right? The explanations, by the way, are not well uh, determined at this point. Um, oh, and I'll skip this. Okay, so, yeah. Um, now, my colleague Felicia Prado and her, her now deceased colleague Jim Sedania has produced this social dominance orientation scale. And they did this great book. This was 20 years ago. And in it, they had a table of gender effects across. These are mostly studies. I think all of them were studies that they had done. And, um, and we'll, we'll forget the detail here, but what caught my eye was the gender effect since I've done gender meta-analyses before. I was like, ah, I could help you with that. Here, they've just got an F-test and maybe as an introduction to statistics, F-tests are not a great effect size. I mean, they are correlated with effect size, but it also depends on how large the samples are in each case. And so, so you need to make adjustments to make it into a true effect size. So uh, ultimately, we did publish a paper directly on this you know, gender hypothesis that um, they differ in social dominance, that men are higher than women in social dominance, and other things. So if you want to read more about it, go there. So here's, here's some example items from the scale of social dominance orientation, that some people are simply inferior to other groups, that in getting what you want, it's sometimes necessary to use force against other groups. This sounds like a depiction of our times. It's okay that some groups have more of a chance in life than others. To get ahead in life, it is sometimes necessary to step on other groups. If certain groups stayed in their place, we would have fewer problems. You can see what's happening. It's a, it's a dominant scale. Right? 
So um, there are 18 items in there. So high scorers are supporting existing group differences or trying to make them even sharper. And low scorers want to level group differences. Well, the theory is males should score higher than females. I've already given you the answer to that. That's typically what happens. So let, let's imagine we, we make another hypothesis that it depends on sample age. Now, I'm not saying which direction, but I, I would guess maybe little kids are more naive than, than adults, and so maybe they're not into dominance as much as adults are. So maybe it's a developmental thing. So um, you can start out with the conventional effect size statistics. So there's our SMD. And by the way, this is a mistake that apostrophe is in the wrong place. I can't believe I made that mistake because I, I, I noticed that when I read papers. Hedges is plural. Okay, Larry Hedges is his name. So you've got males and females, and you divide by the pool of standard deviation. There's a weight we can calculate for it that's basically sample size. You can take a gander at that. Um, so if you do conventional meta-analysis, it's just classical meta-analysis. Here we've got a mean effect size of 0.43, and I put the line on the graph to indicate where that is, roughly. And, um, and then you can see the scatter of studies around, the, around that mean, and, and this contour-enhanced funnel plot shows you that most of those differences are reaching statistical significance, in fact, even a higher, higher criterion for um, statistical significance. And I squared is 64% or so, 65%, which which is usually interpreted as relatively large heterogeneity. So here's here's a heterogeneity statistic for you. Um, I, I don't have tau, tau squared for this particular graph, but um, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Um, so there's an overall gender effect. So this isn't testing our hypothesis about age. For that, we have to do a meta regression. And we do it, and lo and behold, there's a, a, here we have the x-axis is age of the sample, mean years. And now here's the SMD on the y-axis. And indeed, you see a, a sharp slope for, um, for age of sample resulting in smaller gender differences. So that implies that actually kids have larger gender differences than do adults, and that's intriguing. So how do you interpret this pattern? I mean, if, if you think about people who are aging, is it that men are getting softer and women are getting tougher on social dominance? I mean, some kind of combination of those things? I would argue you have to examine the arithmetic means to learn what is happening. So here we go. So let's talk about arithmetic means as effect sizes. You've got to have each study on the same scale, so you make conversions as necessary. And I would argue, why not make them POMP scores? Because those have implicit meaning. You don't have to explain the scale to people, 0 to 100. The example I'll give you today I did before I got wise to POMP scores, so they're going to be on the original SDO metric, which I believe is a five-point scale. You calculate weights for them, so I've gotten this from uh, Lipsy and Wilson's book. Um, it's just sample size divided by the variance for each study. And now you change gender into a moderator rather than being represented as an effect size. So age and gender will become a moderator. So proportion of the sample that's female or male is the, is the moderator. And you're going to have two effect sizes for each study. These are means that are now interpreted as effect sizes. So how much of something becomes an effect size. So you're going to have one for each gender. We're splitting these out of studies. In fact, this pool of studies that I'll show you were ones where the studies disaggregated for gender, so it made it easy to do this particular analysis. It's not the whole literature, by the way. So here, here's an actual output, and again, ignore the details for now, but basically we're regressing the dependent variable, the mean SEO score, on an independent variable. This is female, and we're weighting it. The, the W factor is the one that we defined earlier. So this one replicates what we found overall is that there's a significant effect for gender that females are lower on SDO. See, the confidence interval does not include zero, so um, you've got this negative comparison with males. Uh, if I could go further with this, the mean for males is 2.79, and females are 0.22 um, scale units lower. Uh, if you add in as well uh, the age factor, you can see a positive slope for um, mean age, which I went too fast, and uh, both of these effects are significant. So in fact, mean SDO scores are going larger with time, and um, there you have it. And then uh, let's throw in an interaction for it. Literally, I've calculated an interaction of the two factors and put them into the very same regression. I probably zero-centered them. That doesn't really matter. We'll talk about this nitty-gritty in, in, a, in a discussion 
And I, I've already got a video for you on meta-regression that I'll, that I'll assign later. So indeed, the interaction between um, uh, gen gender and age is statistically significant. How does it look is the question. So you've got to plot it. So there is our original effect that as age of sample goes up, the standardized mean difference goes down, it goes closer to zero. Okay. If you look at the means, you see two positive slopes, one for, for males and females is both the positive slope, but for females, it's a much sharper slope, and that reaches significance in our analysis. So uh, it appears that both genders are creeping towards higher dominance over the ages examined, but more so for females. Now, back to the bigger picture. So the original I squared was 65%. When we look at the means for the studies, it's a wild and crazy picture. Um, it's a 98%. I-squared only goes up to 100%. In fact, you probably shouldn't be able to reach 100% because that's inf infinite. I'll, I'll rant about that a little bit when the time comes. But here are those effects scattered all over there. Now, the individual points on here, like this is um, female point, a female sample, and the pluses are male, and then they're color-coded the same way so that the red ones are pink ones, whatever, are female, and the blue ones are, are male. They're all over the five-point scale. I mean, some are almost to the max. If these are in POMP scores, it would be even easier to see. Um, it's wild. This this is, okay, in the first picture, if we zip back here, you've got a control, each standard deviation is standardizing the effect sizes. So a lot of the noise is now standardized to not being as noisy, and therefore I squared is smaller. In, the, in this picture, any factor that can affect social dominance, whatever it is, culture, CO2 levels, uh, um, wars, um, those things are making the mean values move around the scale. And some are almost to the, to the bottom of the scale. I mean, it's, it's just wild. And you see the genders are all over the scale too. So when we go back to thinking about the genders being so different from each other, well, it's roughly a half a standard deviation difference. Can you see that in this graph? Well, mostly on the right side, you see the, the blue points, the male points are on the right, and the female points are on the left. So it looks like that comparison holds up with the means too. The two different strategies are doing very similar things, although this one is a radically different picture of the world because all possible causes of social dominance are in here. And by the way, in, in, in these graphs, the weight is that what I showed you earlier. So the points that are up higher, higher on the graph, those have much larger samples and smaller variances than those at the bottom of the graph. So this, this is what's happening. And, and the very same thing with the previous graph. Okay? Larger samples up, smaller samples below, boom, boom, boom. All right, so if you do the very same graph I just showed you and turn this into a, um, um, a spikes graph, you see this. Now what I've done is to pair each individual set of means so you can see which ones come from the same studies. And indeed, from study to study, the men and the women are following each other around. I believe that was a Yukon sample there I've just circled. I think these might have been in Taiwan or someplace. I don't remember anymore. It doesn't really matter for this. But, but you see it. The, the means for, for men and women are moving, or boys and girls, are moving around the graph together. And that should give you some clue about the nature of data when you're looking at means. So you've got similar cultural effects happening for the men and women, the boys and girls in each of these comparisons, and that's why they stay relatively close to each other. Now, some advantages of this strategy is that um, it can enrich your conclusions to see that um, model, you, you've got moderators going on in, in like a, a standardized mean difference and, and the equivalent effect size is lack homogeneity, right? So you're, you're maybe getting more details about what's happening with patterns. So it's unclear which of two compared groups is changing across the series of studies. And, you know, that SMD is tricky because it can get negative or positive, bigger or larger, depending on either group's movement or both. So different scores are fraught in many ways, and it's really an interpretive problem. And so it looks like the means, looking at the means, could actually enhance your conclusions. Uh, you've got to put them all on the same scale. So if, if you've got all of them using the same measure with the same scaling, or you equate them, say putting them on POMP scores, it's great. 
Uh, I will, of course, give the caveat while we're passing that one in some literatures where, you know, Hamilton rating scale of depression, I'm not sure POMP scores and converting would help much. Everyone's doing the same Hamilton and they're used to converting it, so just leave it in the original metric. Um, and I'll, I'll develop one other advantage of the, the strategy is maybe you can turn ordinal data into interval or ratio scaling data with the magic of meta-analysis. So here we have the four types of scales conventionally considered, nominal, ordinal, interval, ratios. See the examples I've given you. So like uh, whether someone's married or not, divorce, et cetera, what gender, at least conventionally in society they have, this is nominal data. Uh, ordinal data would be things like your letter grade in a class, and I would argue psych psychosocial scales. And actually many critics say that they're really just ordinal scales. You saw one earlier. Is that a true scale? That's a good discussion to have, I think. Interval scales might be things like SAT scores, IQ scores. The year is an excellent example of an interval scale. The, the, what does zero imply with year? It's pretty arbitrary. Um, analog clocks, you know, the clock with two arms, two hands, um, they, uh, they're interval scales. Uh, and then, then finally, with ratio scales, things like time, millimeters of mercury or blood pressure, that's how well, millimeters of mercury is, is used for blood pressure measurement. Your weight is a ratio scale. Latitude and longitude are both ratio. Um, well, maybe a, a, a spatial person might might quibble with that only one of these has a true zero okay the, the last one the ratio scale um, and only two of these have equal intervals so so the bottom two have equal intervals uh, the first two do not and e even with psychosocial scales it goes way back to the beginning with um thurstone and other other pioneers of psychometric you know um, scholarship that that often these these scales have no true interval feature they're they're really just they're not equal intervals you need that to have interval scales uh, ordering can be done with ordinal interval and ratio ones but not nominal scales i mean married or not doesn't have any implicit order um the theoretically you might argue all of them could be turned into categorical and so when we do that with the bottom three we talk, call it dumbing down your data because you're taking a range and you're turning it into two or more categories so watch out there but those are all of them allow you to do a categorical test so most people who look at this stuff would say that the first two are more or less qualitative especially nominal and then as you go towards ratio you're getting closer to quantitative so here's the bottom scales here are actually on top for quants and the top scales are really on top for qualitative researchers and so, as I've just argued here as well, maybe when you're doing meta-analysis of the means, you're taking psychosocial scales or things like that and converting them into meta-analysis of means, which is ratio data. It's really wild to think that in the magic of meta-analysis, you could actually turn something that's in and, in and of itself ordinal into something that's ratio. Especially if you POM score, you've got a true zero point. All right, so we could argue about that, um, but you can think about it. Each sample of means is averaging across individuals. Maybe the precision results not from the psychometrics, but from the pooling of data. So big data to the rescue people. Now, there are some potential disadvantages to means as an effect size strategy. So as I showed you, almost certainly means will lack homogeneity across studies. So it requires careful consideration of coded moderators. So once again, think of topics plus M. Think about the moderators, the things that could relate to social dominance or whatever your independent variable is. Um, and then um, there's going to be complications when there are diversity of outcome measures that are measuring the, the very same conceptual variables. So you've got to you've got to worry about the equivalency of converting these things into one effect size and do sensitivity analyses and the like to make sure that you don't run into problems. Um, you will have a requirement um, that the studies report means. So if they, they omit them because they're just giving inferential test statistics, you may not be able to convert them into means. And beware, this, this is one that needs a lot of attention and I'm not sure anyone has really worked it out. And um, so um, be careful. In meta-analysis, we have the standard non-independence assumption. Each effect size should be independent from the others, but if you're disaggregating means from particular studies, they have a form of dependency that is not being controlled when you do classical meta-analysis. So you might want to do things that permit clustering, 
like um, robust variance estimators, multi-level models, or structural equation models, all of them have a form that allows you to control for clustering and therefore produce numbers that are more trustworthy. Okay, um, there are unclear statistical power implications for mean strategy compared um, to doing classical meta-analysis with standardized mean differences. No one has looked at this stuff yet. Um, we, we already have, know that we're going to have to go to something that's more like random effects because it's really improbable that you're going to include all relevant moderators. Um, so in, in the case of the, the example I gave you, um, is this difference over here and probably doesn't matter what statistics you use, you could show that that is a statistically different effect. On the other end, I bet you it's non-significant. We just haven't done the, the confidence bands here to look at it. The problem is the statistics would have to use appropriate clustering for that test to be appropriate. Um, and um, yeah, so to conclude, I would say that there are potentially wide applications of meta-analysis of means to replace or augment conventional meta-analysis of group differences, especially the SMD and it deserves more use. Now, if you want to read more on this, there is one that, that dives in a little bit into it, Bond et al. from 2003, uh, examine meta-analysis for raw mean differences. And then the, the my own chapter on this is the one that has dove into it with the most neat, perhaps, um, about its potential use. So you guys know what that is, and you can go and take a look at it. Um, and I, as a caveat to the whole talk here, the things that I've shown you in this talk are not written into a methods paper. As far as I know, I'm the only one who's developed this stuff. So I'm giving you the secret the keys to the secret of life, the universe and everything. And the answer is not 42, almost certainly, by the way. Anyway, um, so I, I could leave you with a few possible discussion questions. I think I, I said a few more as I went through this, but... Um, first, when would using the mean be valuable for meta-analysis? I mean, I've given you some examples of how that might be the case. And I guess I would put it to you with your own meta-analysis. What would happen if you looked at mean values instead of a standardized mean difference? And if you're doing correlational analyses, I don't think you can do this. But um, SMD or unstandardized mean difference, sure. Um, could you just replace meta-analysis of two variable effect sizes using a, a, the strategy of meta-analysis of means? And this last one I left you with, this, this mystery of meta-analysis, is how is it possible that a ratio scale can be produced from studies that use only ordinal scales? I think that's magic. All right, that I'll leave you till the next talk. Um, have a great day.